So now a look at the Roman city. The Roman city was an example of practicality and convenience. They were based on the design of a Roman military camp. So whenever the Roman legions went on campaign, they would march for a portion of the day, and at the end of the day, they would stop and build a military camp. And they were all based on the same very practical and utilitarian design. So we see here the design of a so-called castrum. The elements of a castrum would be a defensive wall made of stakes in case of a military camp. Each legionary would carry a bundle of stakes with him so that when they stopped they had the materials necessary to build the camp. It would consist of a defensive wall, then watchtowers at the four corners, four gates of course coming in from each direction, north, south, east, and west, and then a peripheral road between the defensive wall and the encampment area. And then the commander's tent located at the intersection of the two main roads in the camp in the middle. And then those two main roads would consist of the north-south road would be called the Cardo. And the east-west road would be called the Decumanus coming in from the four main gates. And where those intersected, that would be the location of the commander's tent. Then the tents of the legionaries would be distributed around in the other four quarters. So a Roman city, based on the same design. If a city was built from the ground up. Now remember, I, in my introduction, I talked about the fact that as the Roman armies conquered different territories, existing cities, of course, would not be torn down and rebuilt. They would simply be added on to with Roman elements as needed. We see that in Pompeii, for example. But if a Roman engineer and architects had the opportunity to build a city from the ground up, then that would be based upon that same basic design of a Roman castrum because it worked so effectively, especially with the streets all at right angles to each other so that addresses, so to speak, could be easily located as opposed to, say, Greek cities and typical cities of the ancient world that grew up in a kind of an organic manner following goat paths or whatever, and then expanding out from there. And those of you that have been to Europe and have wandered the inner city areas know how very confusing and illogical the streets can be, making it difficult to find locations or specific addresses. But here in a Roman city, everything was laid out in a very logical grid. So here we see typical Roman city with a wall built around it. When they had a wall, they, didn't all, they weren't all walled. But when they had a wall, it would be built around just like the defensive wall for a castrum with gates on the four cardinal directions. And then the space between the wall and the rest of the city would be called a pomerium. And this was left empty, again, primarily for defensive purposes as needed. Then you've got the Cardo and the Decumanus. And in the center where they intersect, you've got the Forum. And this is where the main civic structures would be located, would be at the Forum in the center of the city. And perhaps next to it would be a market. And perhaps even several markets would be located in this centralized area or conveniently placed in other logical places. So, for example, if the leather makers, because of the noxious odors that would be a consequence of curing leather and that sort of thing, those markets and those industries would be on the peripheral zones of the city. Then you might have a theater somewhere located within a theater district where the citizens could go to enjoy the theater or the amphitheater where you could go to enjoy and witness competitions gladiator combats or animal hunts or perhaps even athletic events that might be performed during Olympic game type celebrations. And then several public baths would be located at various convenient places throughout the city in neighborhoods that would be easily accessible by the citizens of the city. And then most cities would need additional water supplies than what was perhaps available locally and so when that was needed, then Roman engineers would locate distant sources 
as nearby as possible and then survey the, the course from that distant source to the city and build an aqueduct system that would bring water to the city flowing 24 seven into the reservoirs of the city. And then from there distributed through lead and terracotta pipes throughout the neighborhoods to the various districts, the fountains that would be located on the different corners. So in this particular design that I've got here, the little gold squares on the corners would be the public fountains. So that very conveniently located for the citizens of the town. So here is an actual Roman city called Timgad. This is a Roman city located in North Africa today. And so we see here a very interesting example of a Roman city that had been built from the ground up, in this case to accommodate retired legionaries that were settled in North Africa. And so we've got all the elements of a typical Roman city, along with a few additions. Here it is from Google Earth perspective. And as we look at, uh, it's laid out here in a diagram so you can see more clearly. So we've got the Cardo running along here. We've got the Decumanus going through the other, intersecting it at the center of the city. And that is where we've got the Forum. And here we see Pompeii, which isn't as logically organized because Pompeii did not begin as a Roman city. But it began as a city of the Samnites, and that portion of the city is located right here. And then you can see that that's somewhat ill-organized. And then as we move out into the Roman areas, we get more logical organization of the streets and so on. We zoom in on the earliest part. And what we see here is this area would have been the area of docks. Now right now, this is several miles from the sea coast, but in the days of empire, the sea coast would have run right along here, and this is where the docks would have been located. Then as we move up into the city, we move along through the what's called the water gate, main gate uh, into the city, and then the decumanus, the east-west road running through the city, and then the cardo, intersecting it on the north-south coordinate. And then where they intersect is the main forum. And on the forum, you've got the main temple to Jupiter here, and then a smaller temple to Apollo located here, basilica, large public building here, some office buildings, and a variety of other structures. So here's the temple of Jupiter, temple of Apollo, the basilica, again, a business building, and this is the largest building in Pompeii. It's called the Building of Eumachia. It's an example of Eurgetism. As I talked about in an earlier lecture, Eumachia was a priestess of some importance in Pompeii. And since she was a wealthy woman of some significance and elevated position in society, she gave back to the city by donating this large building called the Building of Eumachia. And then over here, we've got fish markets, then forum baths, public baths here, stabian baths, another set of baths over in this quarter, and then down in the southeast section of the city, a theater. As we move along the route of the Decumanus, that leads us out to the main public venue for gladiator combats and animal hunts, the amphitheater at Pompeii, and then right next to it, a large public park with a swimming pool. So now let's take a look at interior decorations in the form of paintings and mosaics. In the area of painting, the Romans will expand upon the Hellenistic painting techniques to create works that are fairly sophisticated in terms of their expression of spatial indicators, as well as just interesting coloristic effects. Roman painting consists of four styles as identified by scholars today. Those four styles are first style, second style, third style, and fourth style. Very ingeniously named styles by our scholars today. So let's take a look at the characteristics of the first style. 
These typically were popular during certain periods of time in Roman history, so from the 2nd to the 1st century BC, first style was most popular. First style basically focused on the simulation of stone. So here we see at Pompeii, an excavated house at Pompeii, down here in this lower section we see some panels that look as though they are veneers of colored stone. Those are, in reality, painted fresco panels, where the intention was to make this concrete wall or this stone wall that has been covered with a thick layer of plaster, then painted, making that look like an expensive surface made of stone veneers. So we see that type of approach even in the modern day here. Some of you may recognize this interior at the Joseph Smith Memorial Building in Salt Lake. These columns appear to be made of green marble. In reality, they are wooden columns covered with plaster and then painted to look like they're made of green marble. Over here you see another view, fairly cleverly disguised. So this is the type of work that is typical of the first style, this simulated stone, but also simply colored panels. So here we are looking at the walls of an atrium in an atrium house in Pompeii, and we see that another favorite device was just rectangular panels that are painted a solid color. Doesn't appeal too much to us today, but nevertheless, this was typical of the first style. Now, both of these styles emphasize the presence of the wall. There's no illusion that would help to disguise the presence of the wall here, so they emphasize the presence of the wall. So here we can see an atrium entranceway with the impluvium and doorways leading off into peripheral spaces. And we get a little bit of painting here on the wall. That would be typical of those solid panels. Here's another example, more intricate and decorative looking, but you get an idea of how these solid panels of color could be used in order to enliven the interior of a Roman house. Second style. This was popular from 80 to about 20 BC. Now when these new styles emerged, the old styles didn't disappear, they just integrated them with them. So second style, here we see the illusion of a third dimension. So in this case, this type of painting style did not emphasize the presence of the wall, but tried to disguise the wall to make it look like there was a third dimension or perhaps a greater space on the wall than what was really there. These would typically feature large murals since the idea was to make that wall disappear and instead suggest that you're looking out past the walls of the house into a garden or something of that nature. So the painting had to cover the entire wall for the most part. As a consequence, the intent was to de-emphasize the presence of the wall. So here is an example of the second style where we see a landscape painted on the walls of this room of some villa. So what the artist is trying to do here is to disguise the wall and make it look like you're looking out at an expansive outdoor scene. So a garden scene. You can't really see here in this photograph, but there is a mountain skyline that extends around all three walls here. You've got this garden wall, various trees, bushes, and so forth. The idea is to try to make it look like we are in an open space instead of an enclosed room. So in order to be able to achieve this, Roman painters had to come up with ways of using spatial indicators to indicate a sense of depth. One of them is what we today call pseudo-linear perspective. I'll show you an example of this in just a second. Another one is the use of atmospheric perspective. And a third is the use of chiaroscuro. Now what spatial indicators are, are methods, or gimmicks, by which an artist tries to indicate the sense of depth between you and distant objects, instead of just having a flat surface with flat images on that surface. So here, for example, is true linear perspective instead of pseudo-linear perspective. This is from the Baroque period in which an artist is representing this urban scene, buildings along a street or a courtyard or piazza, 
and we see a very effective sense of distance here that is a consequence of linear perspective. Linear perspective is generated through the use of a horizon line, that's the supposed eye level of the artist or the viewer, and then on that horizon line is located a vanishing point, which in this case is right in the middle of that doorway. And then in order to generate the sense of perspective, the artist uses orthogonals or diagonal lines that move in the direction of sight toward the vanishing point and converging there. So all horizontal lines in the scene that are going in the direction of the artist's point of view are drawn along angles to that vanishing point. So if I place more orthogonals here, say along the edge of this balcony, it converges on that point. Or along the base of this platform, these steps, converges on that point. Or along the base of this railing, converges on the point or up here on the triumphal arch. Everything converges on the point, which is what makes it look like there is depth here, that this stuff is close to you and that stuff is far away. Of course, it's all an illusion. In reality, everything is perfectly flat and the same distance from you. It's simply this illusion created by the gimmick of linear perspective. Well, the Romans didn't understand linear perspective but they did know that there were angles that had to be generated. They just didn't know how to generate them. In other words, they didn't know about horizon lines and vanishing points. That system won't be invented for another 1,500 years during the Renaissance when a fellow by the name of Brunelleschi will come up with a system of linear perspective that we use in creating traditional works of art. So here we do see in the second style painting we see a wall in a villa that is opened up between these two columns. And then we see beyond the columns this garden wall with a gate in it. And then beyond the garden wall we see the city buildings rising up. Now in a case like this, the linear perspective does not work effectively. So that's why we're calling it pseudo-linear perspective. They've got angles all right, but those angles do not converge on a horizon line and vanishing point. So if I was to place lines on these angles, you can see that they go in all sorts of directions and so create kind of a chaotic sense of a jumbled scene. doesn't make a whole lot of sense, unlike the image that I showed you just a moment ago where it all made perfect logical sense. Romans knew that there had to be angles to indicate depth, but didn't know how to generate or organize those angles. On the other hand, they could guess at it fairly well with some of these landscape paintings. So here in this little sacred landscape, we see several shrines in, in a landscape featuring a bridge and a body of water and a goat and a shepherd here, but also some temples in a mountainous landscape. And those temples do use a version of linear perspective that does keep the different structures organized better than in that last image. But again, they don't all work together because the orthogonals are not converging on a common vanishing point. So that's pseudo-linear perspective, where the artists are experimenting with methods of trying to indicate space without really able to arrive at a successful conclusion for that. Like I say, it won't be developed, for, invented for another 1,500 years. But they were capable of using what we call atmospheric perspective. In atmospheric perspective, the artist tries to simulate the illusion of depth by using devices to suggest that some things are close to us and other things are farther away. Atmospheric perspective is generated by the effects of atmosphere in an actual landscape. So, if you want to make it look like some things are close to us and other things are farther away in a landscape, if you go outside, for example, and you look at distant mountains, 
you'll notice that those mountains have a quality that is defined by the layers of atmosphere between you and those distant peaks. And so as light travels through those layers of atmosphere, it gets scattered in various ways to generate the effects that we call atmospheric perspective. And you see the Romans using those effects here quite effectively. So for example, this definitely looks closer to us than that stuff in the background there. And how does the artist do it? In addition to the fact that this is larger than the structures in the back, that's actually a consequence of linear perspective. But in terms of the atmospheric perspective, what devices is he using? So for one thing, colors in the background that are a result of atmospheric perspective, the layers of atmosphere, are generally cooler in color than the colors that are closer to us. That cooling of the colors, those bluer kinds of colors, are a consequence of the scattering of light that results from the layers of dust and particles in the air and so on. Well, you can observe that at any time. If you just go outside and look at the mountains to the north or the south, you'll see that kind of effect. The Romans were able to observe that and duplicate it fairly effectively in paintings like this one. A second element is reduced value contrast in the background. So by value contrast, I'm talking about elements like we see here. So on this column and wall, we see very high values on the front and dark values on the side and the sharp contrast between the two. On the other hand, in the background, where we look at the lightest values and the darkest ones, there's reduced contrast there. It makes it look blurrier or mistier. Again, that's a consequence of those layers of atmosphere. And then the third element here is less distinct edges in the background. So again, if we look at the foreground, we can see that the edges here between light and dark is fairly sharp and crisp. But if we look in the background at the edges between light and dark, we see that those edges are very soft and blurred. Again, consequences of layers of atmosphere. So by using these characteristics of atmospheric perspective, the Roman artist was able to generate a sense of depth in his second style paintings. The third element is chiaroscuro, a fancy word for shading. So in a fresco painting like this one, we see that there's virtually no linear or pseudo-linear perspective. There's no atmospheric perspective because the depth is not great enough to take advantage of layers of atmosphere, so there's no atmospheric perspective, and yet we do feel a sense of depth. And especially if you look at our figure of Hercules here, the body feels like it has volume and mass and three-dimensionality. Here we see the Romans were quite adept at being able to use shading or chiaroscuro to generate a sense of volume and roundness. So as we look at his the limbs or his buttocks here, we see highlight that gradually gets darker, transitions gradually into darkness as the surface turns away from us, and it generates a sense of roundness. So what chiaroscuro is, is the use of variations in value from light to dark to create the illusion of volume. Now it has to be a variation in value, it can't just be a difference in value because we see that here, for example. This is light value and that's dark value. But there's no gradation between them, so we don't read this as being a rounded surface from here to there. Unlike here where we have a gradation of value, which suggests the roundness. And the third style was popular from 20 to 60 AD. This reasserts the presence of the wall. So the characteristics of this are two. One, it features delicate linear fantasies that frame a miniature landscape. And I'll show you what I mean by that in just a moment. The second characteristic is framed scenes like a painting hanging on the wall. So here's an example from Pompeii. So this is the delicate linear architectural fantasies 
So kind of a fanciful representation of a temple facade with columns and pediment, or gabled roof at least. And then all of that frames a tiny little landscape in the middle of this large monochromatic space. So that would be one characteristic of third style painting. Here's the second characteristic, framed paintings. So the painting itself is second style. But what makes it third style is that it isn't a mural that covers the entire wall, but rather is restricted to a framed area and the frame is painted around the outside of it to make it look as though this is a framed painting that might be hanging on that wall. So that's third style. So this is an example of the fourth style, again from Pompeii, from a villa at Pompeii. It's a combination of the other three styles and was popular in the later imperial period. So we've got a stone wall here covered with plaster and then painted with fresco in order to decorate the interior. So we've got this dado painted to look like a veneer stone. And then we have second style window cut into the wall here, beyond which we see a perspective view of some architecture. And then here we have third style, large monochrome space with a framed painting. So we've got first style, second style, and third style, all combined together into a single painted mural that gives us the fourth style. Another example, a little egregious here in terms of just how complex and bright and colorful this all is. But again, we see first style down here, simulated stone. Second style with the windows cut into the wall, beyond which we see perspective views of architecture. And then third style, some fanciful decorations, framing a little, not a landscape in this case, a little figural work. And then this second element of third style with a framed painting. Just a couple of other rooms featuring this fourth style technique. So here's a bedroom with a Roman bed. And you can see how very lavishly decorated and painted are the walls. And then the floor is covered with mosaic. So here is someone's three-dimensional recreation of a Roman villa, a courtyard. And you can see the paintings on the walls and the colors being used. Another example here gets to you just to give you an idea of what some of these villas would have looked like on the exterior as well. Typical painting schemes being used for its peristyle colonnade. Then that brings us to mosaic, a medium that was invented and popularized during the Hellenistic era, but in that era was used almost exclusively for floor decorations where colored pebbles were arranged in configurations to give us patterns and figural work and so on. And of course, because it's a floor decoration, pebbles are appropriate since the image is intended to be walked upon. And so you don't want to use delicate materials because that would destroy them. So what the Romans will do is to take the technique and apply it not only to floors, but also to the walls. And so here again at Pompeii, we see a small shrine where the decoration is all created with mosaic. The thing that enables Romans to be able to create this type of mosaic is that they're using a wider range of colors, meaning that they're not using necessarily pebbles anymore, but now using tiles or pieces of colored material like glass or even metal possibly but the little colored tiles that are placed into a bed of mortar in order to create these patterns and decorations. This is a close-up view of a mosaic under restoration, and you can see these cups filled full of tesserae. These are small colored tiles, and you can see that when you're using this type of medium, you're able to generate a much broader range of colors, of course, than when you're just restricted to using colored pebbles. Here's another closer view where you can clearly see the tesserae being used to generate this rather realistic image of a couple of ducks. Romans became quite accomplished with their mosaic work. 
So here we're back to that floor plan that I showed you earlier. This is called the House of the Fawn. Called that because in the middle of this pond there was a small bronze figure of a fawn that was recovered during the excavations. Uh, but in any case, what we want to look at here is not that sculpture, but rather this mosaic. And so here in this little alcove, we see this would be a place where the master of the house would receive his visitors or whatever. And so here we see a very famous mosaic. It's about 15 feet across, so, so quite large. And as we look at it closer, you can see here what's called the Battle of Isis. Here is the actual image itself. So we have Alexander the Great. This is an event that occurred, one of the great battles of Alexandrine campaigns in the Persian Empire. So we have Alexander the Great on Bucephalus, his great war horse, and his soldiers driving Darius III, the Persian emperor, off the field of battle. So it's intended, obviously, to look rather like a painting. Here it's been damaged, of course, or there are pieces, large sections that are missing. This has been recently restored in Naples to give us an idea of what the whole thing would have looked like originally. But it's estimated that this particular mosaic contains some one and a half million tesserae. As you look at a closer view of them, you can see the range of colors that have been used here to generate this face of a Persian warrior really quite cleverly and effectively done. And here is Alexander on his war horse. Coming closer, you can see the tesserae. So the idea here is that you can get greater resolution, of course, and color ranges by using smaller and more delicate pieces of tile. The last thing that I want to deal with here during the Republican era are these very unique portraits. So here we see a marble bust of a Roman senator, probably, that features this rather unique approach that we see among the Republicans that we never really saw among the Greeks. Now, in the Hellenistic era, we did get more realistic portraits and ones that carried a more psychological impact but we never really reached the level of reality among the Greek sculptures that we see here among the Romans. This is a typically Republican era approach where we get this extreme realism. So typically these figures are of elderly men, largely because the only time you would have an expensive portrait like this made would be after a lifetime of service when you have earned your place in society. And these kind of sculptures usually would be made for a family in order to put into their portrait hall, so to speak. So as visitors come into the family home, at that entrance area, you've got a portrait gallery that would contain portraits of your ancestors. So typically, these were generated to celebrate a lifetime of service. Now, as you can see, super realistic. The term that we use for this type of realism is verism, or veristic artwork. In other words, absolutely faithful to the subject with no attempt to idealize or to make more beautiful. So where we would get this tradition of verism in portraiture probably stems from the tradition of ancestor veneration. In other words, I told you earlier that the Romans had a very high regard for the past. And so one of the things that they wanted to be able to do was to demonstrate to visitors their heritage by having these illustrious ancestors on display at the entrance to their homes and these would be generated through these very realistic portraits. So the idea of the realism comes from the fact that Roman families, after the death of a father or of a grandfather, would have a death mask made of the individual from which a portrait would be created. So the portraits would be based on a plaster or wax death mask. And of course, the death mask being formed on the actual face of the individual would show all of its realistic characteristics. 
So the process might be, Grandpa dies, and then a death mask would be made of his face. A mask made from plaster or wax. And of course, that would be very realistic, obviously, being based on the face itself. Then that mask would be turned over to a professional sculptor, and a marble portrait would be made based upon the death mask. So it's going to be realistic also. This then establishes early on a tradition in the Republican era of realistic portraiture based upon those realistic death masks. So eventually the tradition had been established for realism and is carried on in the portraits of the living individuals as well. So here are some examples showing this tradition. So here we see a marble portrait of a very important Roman general in which we see a great deal of realism with no attempt to try to idealize or to make more heroic this individual. Or here we see this beautiful portrait. Again, all mature or elderly men because these portraits wouldn't be made until they had offered a lifetime of service to the state and so earned the right to have a portrait made. So in this case, you see an extremely realistic portrait of this grumpy old man, but how beautifully carved this is. The type of thing that we would virtually never see among the Greeks other than in the late Hellenistic era. Now as a contrast to that, this is a portrait that we often see called the bust of a Flavian woman. So this portrait is oftentimes used as a demonstration of the fact that Roman sculptors could carve idealist images if they wanted to, more of the Greek manner, rather than the strictly realistic portraits that we see in those men. So on one of my visits to Rome, I was anxious to try to find this portrait and see if I could actually see it for myself because this is the view that is always represented in art history books in order to demonstrate the Roman artist's ability to create a beautiful idealized portrait and in this oval face, the long swan-like neck, the gentle tilt of the head, and the piled curls of hair on the front of her head. That hairstyle was popular during the Flavian era. You can often identify the periods from which female portraits came by the hairstyles. So I wanted to find this actual portrait so I could see it for myself. So it's in a museum on the Capitoline Hill and on one of my visits I made a deliberate attempt to find this. So this is what I saw as I approached the sculpture from the front the way it is typically intended to be seen. And it's a beautiful example of idealism. Now just if you're wondering what this hairstyle looks like from the back, this is the way that it looks. So at this time, it was popular to have very long hair, thick braid wrapped in a coil around the back of the head. And then over the forehead, you have these thick piles of curls stacked up. But in any case, so we've got this beautifully idealized representation as we approach it from the front. But imagine my surprise when I walked around to the side and saw it from the side. In this case, not quite so idealized, but rather somewhat more realistic, as you can see here. So a beautiful woman from the front and a somewhat more plain woman from the side. The interesting thing to me is it's all the same sculpture, but depending upon the point of view, might be either idealized or realistic. So an interesting combination of the two. So with that, we finish our look at this period of Roman history, the Republican era. In our next lecture, we'll take a look at the early empire, the coming of the emperors, and the demise of the republic. So we'll see you then.